I think all the problems we experiencing are created by us. And anything that's created by us, we should have a solution. We're polluting all the lakes, rivers, and oceans. And we are creating so much garbage dumps that all the unhealthy materials are seeping into the ground and contaminating our aquifers. The food we eat are not grown properly. It's fed by chemical fertilizers, and we also use a lot of insecticides. We are having this traffic problem, this pollution problem, and all the problems that we are facing in today's urban living. There is a solution, but we can't solve it with the current city planning. How can we save land to grow food? How can we reduce the pollution? How can we uh, create a better living environment? The very first cities that ever were, or Nineveh, Babylon, they all produced their own food. All of them. That's how they got to be a city. Urban agriculture began with agriculture first and then urbanization. As urban environments increased, it marginalized the farms. So now they're on the outskirts. So now you have transportation problems, pollution, water problems, everything, food spoilage, everything is bad about this system, right? So now we have people that realize that they want to put their food back in the city. How do you do this? We know that developed countries have 75 or 80 percent of the people living in the cities. China is going to do in about 25 years what it took the United States to do in about 200 years. About 40 years ago, China has less than 20 percent urban populations uh, of a country with 1.3 billion people. And today, in, in less than 40 years, China has over 50 percent of urban population. When you got three billion more people and you've already used all the arable land, what are you going to do? You got three billion more people on the way. There's no doubt, as the population is also growing, uh, in most countries anyway, that inevitably the only answer to this problem, because the land is, has a limit, physical limit, will be to go up. Since ancient time, human beings and human race are always pursuing a better life, better living environment. Uh, right now where I'm standing is the, the 23rd Street Madison Park in New York City. And in front of us is the 113 years old Fred Iron Building with the first elevator system in New York City. And right behind me, about 10 blocks away, is the landmark uh, Empire State Building. When I worked with my father in Paris at the Louvre, and this is certainly not a tall building because it's almost all of it's underground, but the architectural solution was completely new and provocative. We work on the Taipei 101. The Ping'an Tower, 600 meter in Xinjiang. We just completed the Shanghai Tower. That becomes one of the tallest buildings we work on. It's called El Burj in Dubai. But this is where, uh, for us, many things started. The, the vertical city, it constitutes multiple sky bridges and sky lobbies. You can see, you can see these sky lobbies here. They're actually sky bridges. To date, we have reached a height of half a mile, like Burj Khalifa, which is about 800 meters high. But now we're talking about 1,600 meters high and that requires technologies. We decided to restrict the size of a city we want to build to a half a mile by half a mile, or 0.8 kilometers by 0.8 kilometers. Because in that area, 
people can get from one place to another place within 15 minutes of walking. If you can get to a place within 15 minutes from your house, there's no need to have cars. The point of the vertical city is to free up open land and have people live in a more compact way so that we don't use up all of our natural area. The vertical city will only take away about 1.5% of the land. So the other 98.5% of the land can be used for open space, for growing vegetables, for fruit orchards, and ponds for fishes. This is Central Park in New York City. There are many people come here every day to enjoy. We have jogging trails, we have bicycle trails. Well, Vertical City can have quality of life that's very similar to what we have in a horizontal city. But in many ways, it can be much better. We don't have to put up with the noise of ambulances, fire engines. Hopefully, if we plan it right, we still can preserve a park like this one behind us. If we've been a city, so people have a place to mango, to rest up and keep the greenery and sustainable, in addition to the sustainable design. The social aspect of a city is very important. We need to provide areas where people can congregate, where people can, can shop in fly lobbies and uh, talk to each other and know their neighbors. So one of the important things with tall buildings is to give people the normal experiences in life. So by having a, a podium that contains shopping and schools and recreational areas where they can walk around and shop the way they normally do, by having things like the sky lobbies, as they're called in Vertical City, where you have greenery, you can see the sky, you can swim, jog, ride a bike, kids can play. The enclosed part of the vertical city can provide all the shops needed. And it, it functions like a village center, while the podium at the ground floor is like a city center. Is the technology here today? Yes, the motors are here. Uh, configuring them in the tall building arrangement is not a trivial effort, but it's, uh, it's, it's relatively trivial. Shuttles go to sky lobbies. They just go boom, 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 boom. And they transfer to local elevators. Now we have what we call the ropeless elevators. They have no limit to how high it can go. You can imagine a, a ropeless freight elevator coming to a lower level. Nobody would see it. It's behind the scenes. The ropeless shuttles would go up to the Grand Garden. Now, a ropeless elevator is untethered. There are no suspension ropes. The only friction might be on roller guides to, to guide the car up, and that's, those could be air. The rapid transit, you know, like high-speed rail, is getting very popular around the world. So people can get from one vertical city to another vertical city in a matter of uh, hours or less. You can also drive a car from a vertical city to another vertical city. So there's no restrictions to the movement of people. We see a lot of farmland, and we can see ponds that people can use for recreation or for boating or even fishing. At a distance, you'll see mountains and forests. So you, you will have a feeling that you're pretty much part of nature. Yes, you can see the clouds. Instead of looking up, you can look down onto the clouds. And that's very interesting. We can live in a space where we can enjoy the life we're used to, like having a dinner in a restaurant or in a sky lobby with friends and relatives, or have a drink with some business associates. 
And also I like to introduce, uh, I'm very passionate about reintroducing all the folk art that we are losing in today's world. Most of the food that we eat came from all over the place. And shipping the food from distant places caused a lot of damage to the foods and also increased the shipping cost. So I thought, why can't we grow foods within where we live so we can enjoy all the fresh foods daily? Farmers nearby can bring the food to the sky lobby that is like a food market. But a city like New York, it's almost impossible to collect the garbage and sort them out and recycle. While the vertical city can solve this problem very simply by having a room with a number of garbage chutes to separate the paper, cardboard, the metal, the aluminum, plastic, glass. We, at upper level, we can generate electric power more efficiently than that lower level. And also, for power generation, the air at the upper level is always more steady and stronger than at lower level. We can tap the cooler air one and a half kilometers up and bring it down and cool the apartment. There are now transparent solar panels, totally transparent. Well, we have LED lighting, which was first really used in automobiles, now it's all over the place in automobiles, and now it's getting to be extremely widespread in buildings. Oh, the cost of vertical cities. Most people have the impression that uh, it will be too expensive. As much as building the city itself will cost more money, but then you save all the streets, all the infrastructure in the streets, the lights, the road signs, the pipes on the ground, and also you save the cost of land. When you have large numbers of people, it's actually much more efficient. This is one of the things that Ken and Kellogg discovered in the course of doing this book. Much more efficient to build tall buildings. They do use energy, but it's divided up between all of the people who are in the building. The running of vertical city will also be much cheaper than a conventional city because we don't need ambulances, we don't need fire trucks, fire engines, we don't need police cars. Now, opening up the road surface takes a half a day, and the repair takes probably no more than two hours, and closing up the road surface takes another half a day or more. In vertical cities, you can just go to the area where the damage is and repair the damage in a matter of an hour or two, and the whole thing is done. So the cost is like a fraction. I think, by the way, I think that there will be vertical cities. Will they be all over the world? I'm not sure and the theory has to be proven, and the way you prove it is you build it. Technology is ready. That's not an issue. In fact, we've been overdue. In New York, that could be a, a smaller version of Vertical City, somewhere like Queens, that's accessible to Manhattan. When you go to China or to Sao Paulo, we're going to have a huge demographic change as more and more people in the United States and around the world become older, they're going to need the kind of services that a vertical city offers. All we need is the will to do it, because we have all the technologies to build this vertical city. The sooner we make this happen, the sooner we can change our environmental problems. <laughs>